clown cafe. The grub is downright gruesome, but your appetite's so fake. Cause food's a little funny, food's a little funny, food's a little funny at the clown cafe. On by the clown cafe, your favorite meals on wheels. The menu is disgusting and it's full of special deals. Nothing here is good for you, so grab yourself a tray. Cause food's a little funny at the clown cafe. Drop on by the clown cafe. Drop on by the clown cafe. Gobble up your order quick before it runs away Cause food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe Why not visit after school and have yourselves a bite? An appetizing appetizer certain to delight We haven't done it right unless it makes your teeth decay Cause food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe Drop on by the Clown Cafe Drop on by the Clown Cafe. The grub is downright gruesome, but your appetite's obey. Cause food's a little funny, food's a little funny, food's a little funny at the Clown Cafe. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here, and happy Friday the 13th! Because you all know what today's episode is going to be for Halloween Horror Reviews 4. Today's episode was originally going to be a review, but I remember that this October was going to have a Friday the 13th. I decided to cancel that review, postpone it, or maybe likely for another day. And decided I was going to do a franchise ranking. And since obviously because you know what the day is, you know the franchise ranking I'm going to do. Because you can tell by the mask I'm wearing, the, the attire I have behind me, the box that I have behind me. The mask costume, the machete I'm holding. This film is going to be for none other. No, this episode is going to be for the ranking of all 12 Friday the 13th movies. And some of these have had updated opinions as the years have progressed. So... We're going to be ranking all these movies from the worst to the best. And we all know how that goes. We start with, obviously, what is definitely the number one most dreadful fucking movie of this series. Kicking off in 12th place at the bottom worst is going to be Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Rides a Fucking Boat to Vancouver. <sighs> this is a prime example of false advertising. You would think that by this title, you would get a badass sequel with Jason going to New York and slaughtering the fucking New Yorkers and legitimately having a showdown with police officers. Well, you don't get that at all. Because apparently they were too cheap to do that. Where's this whole movie set instead? It's on a fucking cruise boat that looks like the Titanic. The entire movie, he's just on a boat. That's all it is. So this should be called Jason Takes a Boat. Or Jason Rides a Boat. Not Jason Takes Manhattan. Because he's in... And by the time you do get to New York, though, you don't even care anymore. Because he doesn't even get to New York for, like, the last 12 minutes of the film. So, the whole New York stuff is literally the whole ending. And plus, the New York place in this movie, you can tell it's Vancouver. The movie is flawed in many ways. The biggest of which involves Rennie Wick Wickham's constant visions of Jason Voorhees as a young child. And oftentimes she's touched by these visions, and yet Jason is either with her at the time, or he's near her, and it makes someone want to ask, what is going on in this girl's head? The visions may even be caused by deep psychological trauma suffered from events of flashbacks seen towards the end, which almost drowns and encounters Jason as a young child. But that flashback is a prime example of how flawed this movie is in terms of continuing of the series. It's determined in part two that Jason did not drown as a child, but survived and spent the rest of his childhood in the woods alone, and eventually led to him being a fully grown undead serial killer that fans had grown to love. Another major flaw is the ending, and it's how Jason dies. How does Jason die? Well, he dies in the sewer, drowned in toxic waste. 
And seconds before being doused with said chemicals, water shoots out of his horribly designed mouth for no apparent reason. His design in this movie sucks. He looks like... He looks slimy. He looks horrendous as hell. He looks just wet in almost every scene. It was clearly the intention of the player seduced to remind the viewers that it would be the second time Jason had drowned in his life, but I would definitely doubt it. And how he dies is... His death scene is also the stupidest death for Jason. Because as he drowns, he's like, Mommy, don't let me drown! Mommy! <laughs> like a whiny-ass kid. Oh my god. And then the audience shows the body of a young boy. It's obviously Jason Voorhees. And the only way to indicate that Jason was always a boy, but... Maybe being reborn with a body of swamp, algae, and barnacles and the toxic waste disintegrated. And it's highly likely once again. And there's even, apparently... Jason even has the apparent ability to change places at the blink of an eye, in which you see in one place for one moment, then seems to move with lightning fast stealth in front of the characters, almost like Freddy Krueger. And Jason's design as far as definitely just a shitty Jason design, sh just a shitty setting, lies to you, completely just wants to rip off your time and money, and it's 100 minutes for no reason even. If you get a good thing out of this, besides just Jason being in a fake New York... Which the, this movie should indicate that you should get an epic badass sequel, which you don't. The only good thing you get was the boxing kill. And that's it. In the end, Jason rides a fucking boat to Vancouver. Jason takes Manhattan, but I'm not going to call Jason takes Manhattan because he doesn't go to Manhattan. He goes on a boat and he goes to Vancouver. Regardless, it's a shit fest and it's never being notched. So Jason rides a boat to Vancouver. Go fuck yourself. The end. Kicking off at 11th place is going to be Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning. Easily, no doubt, the first dud of the series. This one was just boring to watch. It's not entertaining in the slightest. It's like they tried to do... It's fine they tried to do a new killer, but they just didn't get it right. And the other difference between A New Beginning and the previous entries is that there's a lot of adult authority figures present, but the authority only works to a certain degree. Richard Young pretty much plays Matt, the head of the home Tommy's put in, and while he does an okay job, his authority is not that present. And the supposed heroine of the film is Pam, and once more to be di and once more to be different than the previous films, she's not a teen, but assistant head of the home Tommy and other teens are in, and once again, his charge doesn't work well. While the film is littered with a boring or useless cast of characters, there are some highlights. I mean, Sugar Ross plays Reggie, who is another child, and like Tommy was in the previous movie before this, and Shara Ross can scream better than most of the women do in this film. And Kara Locato is great as the crazy neighbor Ethel. And the only two teens that one could really care for, Eddie and Tina, who are played by John Harvard Dixon and W.S. Voorhees, who, have, who definitely has great hair, also do get the best deaths, some of the best deaths of the franchise. Of the other teens, none are particularly noteworthy, except for as Tiffany Hellman plays Violet, but only for her hair. Now, another major reason this one just doesn't work well is because... Yeah, it's not Jason doing the killings, which... And also, in general, it's just not very gory. And a paramedic called Roy discovers his son has been killed at the home Tommy ever stay at, and he uses Jason's old M.O. to get revenge. In fact, they never acknowledge this movie's events in the next films. It is literally... Like, this one's just forgettable. I have nothing else to say about this movie. It's all because it's just forgettable. It's just pretty bad. You could... They don't acknowledge this movie ever again in the next movie. So, after the final chapter, if you want to continue this series, you could literally skip right to Jason Lives after the final chapter, and you would literally miss nothing. Yeah. It's that forgettable. It shouldn't really be part of this franchise. Kicking off in 10th place is going to be Jason X. Okay, I'll admit. This one is pretty fun and entertaining at times, but it just gets way too wacky. Yeah, the series had just gotten way too ridiculous at this rate, but now Jason, of all things, goes to outer space in the future. Jason goes to space. Who came up with that idea? Someone on drugs? It's entertaining, but it's way too ridiculous. Now, it feels more like a parody. Let's face it, if you're going to rent one of the later movies in a slasher movie series, you'd be an idiot to expect high art. The fact that this is the 10th movie in the Friday the 13th franchise, which is the most dragonly ball-scratching, horse 
which is one of the most longest horror series is yet. And it's set in space, doesn't exactly suggest it's going to be an all-time classic, but it's a good and fun way to kill an hour and 30 minutes nonetheless. But the plot is still so thin, and even a slight breeze will make it disintegrate, and the horror element is practically non-existent. The adjacent movies abandoned that long ago in favor of just providing dumb escapism with inventive and bloody death scenes, in which this film certainly provides. People get sliced in half, impaled on large spikes, blown up. One woman even gets her head dunked in liquid nitrogen and shattered on a desk. But the characters are one-dimensional and it's so cheesy, you'd more likely laugh than scream. And, and even watching the scene where Jason gets transformed to Uber Jason for the first time and not have a colossal grin traverse her face. There's even a later scene which even pokes fun at the early movie's cliches with a hilarious beating one camper to death with the other sequence. In spite of the second-rate effects and general silliness, a tenant film in the series has visual energy and freshness that has been missing for at least a decade. And the characters are all stereotypes, and they're good stereotypes in new snazzy futuristic costumes. And they get to use snazzy new assault rifles and hologram projectors and stuff to fight back. It doesn't work, of course, and Jason still kicks everybody's butt. But a change in atmosphere and set does rescue the film from the tedious dread of previous installments. There's some actual levity and some winking tri tribute to some of the classic conventions of earlier films. Like when Jason... And it's like what just like I said earlier when Jason beats a camera to death with another one. And it's okay because they're holograms even. And Jason gets a not bad new look in the middle of the film. It doesn't add much to the character, and although at least it is different enough to help you see the character again after kind of decades of over familiar familiarity, and this was before we got Freddy vs. Jason, and the cast star like many of the other Friday films, just Jason Fodor. There's a varying degree of personalities, and most get so little screen time they're forgettable. Noble exception though is easily less like Sadoik, who does give a terrific performance, but if you watch this as its own thing, it's definitely enjoyable, but as a Friday 13th film, not, not exactly. In ninth place is going to be Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Now, I'll admit this one. It's not one of the greatest, but it's definitely also not one of the worst Friday movies. Because the thing is with this one, this one has a big problem. The MPAA is pretty much is how this movie got potential got botched. And right here, you could have had another epic sequel, but... The MPAA were crybabies, they thought it was too violent, so they ordered all the kills to be nerfed. The best thing about this film is the plot structure, and at least tries to offer the audience something new rather than the regular chop and slash action that Jason does in every film, much like Part 6 did. I'm not sure the whole telekinesis subplot was inspired by Stephen King's carry, but the sequences between Tina and Jason are interesting and fun to watch, as this seemingly helpless girl gives Jason some serious battle scars, and I like the sequence with the power lines and the whole finale that took place in the house, and it's definitely... This is also Kane Hodor's first performance as Jason, and despite some of the more not-so-great ones he had, this is one of the best... Ja he's one of the best Jasons I've seen in this series. He's a senseless killing machine with a very intimidating facade. There's some clever deaths and great makeup effects throughout, and I dare say it would have been more successful if the studio had left it to hell alone in order to get in order for it to have the really important R rating, but the new blood was just butchered by the MPAA and all the crybabies that were too scared of violence. Okay. Almost every horrific thing that happens in the movie being either curtailed or removed entirely. With the exception of a few scenes, the movie was definitely almost totally sanitized. So we have a movie that unavoidably feels incomplete, which it is, and just has half, just had half of most of the scares taken out by unscrupulous editors, and add to this, the fact that the movie isn't paced well, and it drags a lot in certain points even, and Jason and the New Blood is not a terrible movie, but it's definitely one of my least favorite Jason films. Even with the series trademark gore exercised by Paramount, and a story that drags because it's busy setting everything up again, the New Blood is a solid slasher movie, and some memorable scenes and a nice twist at the end. And some of the less massacred kill sequences are impressively inventive, and one particular scene sticking him definitely involves someone's eye and a clown horn. The movie keeps a decent bit of tension going throughout. I think one of the great ones, but I'd say it's better than the ones I previously mentioned. Although, there is one bad review Jason movie that's next. I find still way better and actually more fun to watch than this one. In 8th place is gonna be, controversially, Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday. Now, now before I do this. This, the reason why it's in number 8... And not hires because I'm talking about the theatrical version for this movie. The unrated cuts don't count for this. Okay? But, regardless, yeah. Okay. 
I get most of you do hate this film. I did too at the time, but over as the years have progressed, I've honestly better appreciated this movie, and I can see why it has a bit of a cult base, despite still getting hated by a lot of fans. I just feel like this one just did a better job at doing something different than 5 or 8 or Jason X, which I think are much, now think are worse movies than this. Than the unrated version is, but it's a totally crazy sequel, but in a strange way, I think it's lots of fun. The body count is gnarly and enormous. There's 19 guys, 6 women, there's gratuitous female and male nudity, the gore is graphic and strong. It's like, this movie even almost got an NC-17 rating. And the, movie, and the movie moves so fast, you don't have time to stop and think about how really stupid it is. My favorite sequences easily have to be involving the three horny teenagers that camp up by Crystal Lake. It has really nothing to do with anything the rest of the picture, though, but there are some plenty of nude scenes for all the horny Friday the 13th fans, and as the one of the goriest killings I've ever seen in a major slasher picture, that was before Terrifier 2's bedroom kill happened. This was pretty much the bedroom kill of the 90s. And personally, I was glad that I was seeing something new here. It's not it's not all the new as anybody who has seen the fun, many other fun films like films that seem to have better reviews than this. But I was willing to put aside a few a few minor quibbles. Like, what do you say? Well, <coughs> it definitely would have been nice if the Crit and Duke character had been more, sometimes had been more heroic and not always the, and much less douchey, but. And where the hell did the magic dagger come from? But there's a few scenes here that are pure gold. The first scene, you have the opening bit where Jason faces off with the SWAT team. And I always wonder why no one tried that ever before. Like, big dude isn't so tough and faced with high-powered weaponry, is he? And also, the scene with the corner of Jason's heart, it's just so goofy watching him ch chow down on it like a McDonald's burger. It's so hilarious. And Crane Duke may be douchey at times, but he's still a fun character to watch. It makes the movie gold. And the movie takes this very unjasonish turn and makes him this fallen S body jumping killer, which definitely does not work, and I can understand the criticism with that. That's just a stupid idea. That Jason was a warm the whole damn time. The movie's suspense works well enough though, and it does a great job of explaining the backstory and importantly creating interesting characters. The main character's a tough geek, the bounty the bounty hunter is tough and gruff. And they both are well rounded enough for the movie, especially in a series where most characters are not developed to scare who might be killed. However, strongly roles are created and added to giving the viewer a much greater attachment to the characters as they actually know that much more about them than the average slasher fic. And, and also, do I also cannot forget the epic ending that literally sets up Freddy vs. Jason where Freddy's glove pops right out and grabs Jason's mask and pulls it under the grave. So, yeah. The unrated version of this movie is the movie you should watch when you watch this. I think the only way to get the unrated version is if you buy the Scream Factory box set, but... But yeah, Jason Goes to Hell. I think it's... I used to hate it at first, but I've grown to like this movie over time. I think it's more fun. I like that it's more gnarly. I like that it's actually still treats Jason as a threat. It's it's not Freddy's Dead. It's not Hollywood Resurrection. It's not TCM The Next Generation. It's definitely a massive improvement from Jason Takes a Fucking Boat. So, either way, just in short, Jason Goes to Hell is not, not really like an epic masterpiece of a movie. It's not one of the best Friday 13th movies, but it's definitely one that's gotten better over time. Kicking off in 7th place is going to be Friday the 13th Part 3. Another thing, because this one's in 3D, I got the 3D glasses on this mask for this part. This was the very movie that introduced us to that iconic hockey mask in the series. The film starts with a recap of the last scene from part 2, where Jason is seen getting up after he is assumed dead, then the movie begins, and we get a funky and upbeat 80s background song starting the film, and right after the song ends, Jason begins his killing spree, and starting with two unsuspecting store owners, and then moving on to an unsuspecting teens at a small farm area. The things I like about this movie, first of all, is the fact that Jason first gets his trademark hockey mask in this movie. The mask is a massive improvement from the second part 2 that was just way too silly to take seriously. And it makes Jason look much scarier. Another good thing about this movie is Dana Kamel. Although her lines and dialogue in the film are somewhat cheesy at some points, her character is very convincing as the teen heroine. And whenever she's frightened, she screams to she definitely screams one of the most funniest screams yet. And I love how she screamed in the film as well. And the plot's simple. There's teens looking to get away for the weekend drinking drugs and sex. Then of course, one by one, they added to the list of murders at Crystal Lake. On the bad side, 
though this movie, the reason why this film is definitely weaker compared to part two, it's the dialogue, the seriously, it's like seriously, man, these characters just sound like characters in Grand Theft Auto V, and some of them just to sound even worse than that. The fight scenes are repetitive, just Jason chases Chris, she gets Jason, Jason chases Chris, she gets Jason, Jason chases, chases Chris, she gets Jason again and again and again and again. The chase scene is a fairly big standout in the movie, and starts with the bane as Chris finds the first body, and it doesn't let up from there. Even if her annoying moaning and scream gets you on your nerves, nerves, the fight that she does put up with Jason can be appreciated to some horror fans, but it just gets done repetitively, and it gets annoying as it progresses. And with the exception of the final chapter, I mean, the final chapter's chase scenes were better, and the better ones of the series. Unlike here, where it's just done on repeat. Jason sustains some decent damage, but as we all know, Miss Voorhees, Mr. Voorhees takes a licking and keep on ticking. Even though the big scare moment at the end is totally ripped off in the original, you just can't help but be creeped out of the way Jason just appears in that upstairs bedroom window watching Chris in the canoe. The first act is a bit slow to start with a few too many gags that feel contrary to the later portion of the film, and some of the effects are cheesy to the point of taking you out of the film. And while it's entertaining, I can definitely see some... Definitely audience members being turned off by the constant 3D coming at your shots because this, now this wasn't released in 3D in its first release. This was given to 3D on the re-release and a lot of DVDs now release the film in 3D nowadays. But they could get turned off by the constant 3D coming at your shots now. So maybe sometimes it'd be better not to watch this in 3D for those people that don't like the 3D gimmick. But this film, Friday 13th Part 3 3D. It's alright and enjoyable, but it's just clunky compared to part 2. Kicking off in 6th place is going to be the original Friday the 13th from 1980. Okay guys, so because Jason's not in this one, this was the one where his mom was the first killer, Jason didn't appear until part 2, so the hockey mask is going to be off for this one. And this was the one that started this whole franchise. Now y'all remember I gave this a 7.5 out of 10 when I first saw it. Well, yeah, it used to have a higher score, but this one, in comparison to Jason Goes to Hell, that's gone slightly up as the years progressed, this one has gone kind of down because of the fact that this movie just feels, I think this movie's just really overrated. It's the most overrated film of the series. It just feels too slow and nothing much happens. Yeah, the jump scare at the end, though, is definitely still one of the scariest horror movie moments. But there's much but there's much else that is memorable about the film. There's just not that much else memorable about the film besides Betsy Palmer's performance as Miss Voorhees and Kevin Bacon's debut in this film. Friday the 13th does have average scenery, mainly rural homes and trees. The acting is decent, and I love the soundtrack. It isn't all that original, and a number of other movies stealing the camp killer idea, like Burning Sleepaway Camp. But Friday the 13th does manage to be sometimes entertaining all the way through, at least. The, I don't see any point in going through the plot. Just most horror fans would know it by heart. Instead, here's a few things that I do like about the film. The kill scenes I did like. Tom Savini's special effects are great. And I especially like the scene where Kevin Bacon's character is speared from under the bed. And second of all, regardless of the, number, regardless of the times I have seen this movie... It does have an atmosphere of fear about it. The repetitive music, the unseen killer, and the bodies dropping at every turn have always do give me chills. And I enjoy the final showdown between the killer and the final girl, but the reason I think it's the most overrated of the film series because it is way too fucking slow to get to the horror. This movie feels just really boring at times. Even though Friday the 13th was made early in the slasher cycle, how hard was it to really predict the outcome? And the characters of this movie are so stupid. They've seen smarter characters in this franchise, and these are definitely not smart characters. Just about all of them die for their own stupidity. And they couldn't even demonstrate any brain power. In order to get the most out of this film, like, you have to watch the uncut version. Friday the 13th was designed around 70's gory set pieces. It's a nice way to start an iconic franchise, but... It's definitely a very overrated one at best in a way. Thankfully, the ones, some of the ones that came out, thankfully the next one that came after this movie turned out to be much better. Kicking off in fifth place is going to be the 2009 remake of Friday the 13th. Yeah, I think this is one of the most underrated reimaginings of the series. 
And I don't really like calling this one a remake like many other people seem to really do, because it's not even a remake of the original movie. Friday 13th has an incredibly powerful first 15 to 20 minutes, and it really kicks off with a bang. Jason is back, he's better than ever, and then something goes fractionally wrong and we fall back into old territory. Everything does become a bit too familiar, and it does better than most horror films in the sense that it really doesn't become too tedious until the last 10 minutes or so. The main characters are strong in their performances without being memorable, and the cameos are the real scene stealers that include gas station attendants and a man named Donnie. And a lot of the jokes from All Concerned really hit the mark though, and are a nice touch to the film. And from start to finish, the film keeps you on the edge of your seat. It isn't so much the suspense, but instead the moments you know are just coming are coming just not when or how they'll be approached exactly. It takes there's plenty of gore for the gore lovers who have, are familiar with this series. There's some definitely sexual explicitness for the perverts because it's a Friday 13th movie. Of course, there's going to be a lot of that. And there's plenty of drugs for the stoners like an old-fashioned horror movie should contain. The first thing's first. It's definitely not your regular Jason. He's got a few upgrades in this movie. He looks like he's had a few steroid injections. And one of the surprising, arguably most intimidating things is his newfound ability to run. If a machete tooling... Tootie mentally changed, challenged angry 7 foot 300 pound hockey mask wearing man wasn't scary enough. He can now outrun you. And of course he still retains his ability to teleport anywhere he just wants to show up. And I think Derek Mears was really amazing as Jason. He's definitely a major improvement over Ken Kersinger. And is, and is definitely probably my second favorite Jason behind Kane Hodder. And the only real complaints though I would have about this movie is definitely the ending. Usually, most of the Friday 13th movies end with all Jason dead. Even the, some of the shitty ones ended with Jason dead. And that was it. This one is the first one where Jason actually lives. Yeah. And we don't really get a complete ending. And that's why this movie should have had a sequel. I would have liked to see a sequel to this remake where Jason's in the snow. Actually see how Camp Crystal Lake thrives in the snowy winter. Now that would be something I'd like to see. Right there. We should have had more films with Derek Mears as Jason. Not just one movie. But no, because we didn't get that because we had the Elm Street remake that sucked dick the next year and killed off this whole trend. The film does fizzle out a bit after a spectacular opening, and Jason himself looks pretty darn cool as well. And then, especially with the one scene where he does have the potato sack. Even though Jason doesn't get much screen time in this movie either, the filler component of the film is as good as it's ever been, and some generally funny dialogue are one or two worthwhile characters. And by mainstream standards, the characters are definitely pretty stupid, but then again, Friday the 13th has plenty of stupid characters. But other than those problems, I don't think there's much else fans of the series without anything to complain about with this movie, because Friday 13, 2009 is a fun addition to the series, and no, I'm still not calling it a remake, so don't make me call the remake. Kicking off in fourth place is going to be a controversial pick, Freddy vs. Jason. This was the movie fans long had waited to see for 10 years since Jason Goes to Hell's epic ending. After 10 years, the wait was finally over. Now, while I wasn't old to see enough to see this movie when it first released, I had no idea these characters even existed back then, obviously. I felt it was an epic crossover, seeing two iconic slasher characters finally getting to duke it out on screen. Freddy Krueger obviously has been dead for years in the real world, the dream world, by the time of this movie. And since Freddy's in hell and forgotten in the real world, Freddy has a plan to bring back Crystal Lake killer Jason Voorhees to life in the real world. And Freddy thinks by bringing Jason back to life to bring fear on Elm Street and making teenagers remember in Freddy again, because Jason is an instant killing machine, Jason isn't willing to step aside though. And now with the terrified town in the middle, now Freddy has to find a way to kill Jason by going in his dreams before Jason takes Elm Street over from him. And, he, and of course you have another subplot where a scared teenager finds a way to bring Freddy to reality from her dreams, so Freddy and Jason then enter into a horrific and bloody showdown, and bodies of harmless teens pile up in increasingly horrific and derulist inventive ways, and an almighty beast of a bed crusher just slays him with just with a tip of Jason's super sharp sword. It definitely sounds bad to any film respecting person, but it's far from bad. It's tremendous fun guessing who and how the victims will die next, and tension even creeps up towards the end of the and to kill the preceding dark vein of gross and darn sadistic humor, and that's surprising with such a daft premise, the, the, the makers of Freddy vs. Jason make no real attempts at scaring your audience, and instead offers view, 
and offer viewers a campy, tongue-in-cheek popcorn horror packed with busty one-liners and even more gore. The cast of the film, they picture performances accordingly. <sighs> like, it's all, well, like, exception of the teenagers, though. Robert Englund does ham it up as to 11, like he usually does with Freddy here, and as a couple of us sort of bimbos get their therapies out, and Ronnie Yu, the man responsible for the equally entertaining Brian and Chucky before this, he keeps the action moving at a brisk pace and provides plenty of slick, cloud-pleasing moments for fans, for fans of mindless sex and violence, but the problems I do have, though, with this movie, I would definitely have to say, well, Jason's design, I mean, we should have had Kane Hodder play Jason right here. Fans wanted Kane Hodder in this movie, but they thought Kane Hodder was way too larger than Robert England and much too stronger than Robert England, so they wanted a more tiny-headed Jason, and we got a pretty... And I'm just not a fan of this Jason. I forget the Jason in this one, but I'm this guy's one of my least favorite Jasons. And also, the acting from the teenagers as well, like Monica Kina, who plays Lori, and she's in this film, and Lori in this movie is just one of the worst lead characters I've probably seen. She's whiny throughout the entire movie, and Freddie kept calling her bitch over and over, and she literally decides, she's like running away and stuff, and she's terrified, but then suddenly she's all like, no, I want to take down Freddy Krueger, he killed my mom, I want to take him down. Despite the fact they don't have one connection together at all. Like, if you wanted to have a human protagonist in this movie, like, the human protagonist in this film should have been... Yeah, it should have been... Man, I should have been the girl from Elm Street 4 and 5. I forget her name, guys, but... It should have been... You know the girl from Elm Street 4 and 5? It should have been her kid. And it should have been Tommy from the Friday 13th movies, both teaming up in this one. And then it'd be more of a complete crossover right there. And that's and there'd be better human characters right there. Tommy finds the, could have like that, you could have like the dream child's kid or something like that be, or have like the girl from Street 4 and Tommy from the Friday 13th movies teaming up to take down, to pretty much take down Freddy and Jason in their fight right here. They have to stop Freddy and Jason in this movie. You, that would have been a good subplot. And Tommy has to go down to Elm Street. Better subplot than these idiot teenagers. But it doesn't bother the movie at all because it's directed better than your average slasher and it's a careful use of color tint. It's the and two excellent stage battles and a superb party massacre or blast to watch. And considering the studio could have handled this to anyone and made a profit with a pleasant surprise as well. And it even does take a while to get to the fight with Fred and Jason, but it really pays off and it's the best moment of the film, one of the best fights I've ever seen. It's a shame that we never got a sequel we deserved because it would have been nice for this to become a franchise. Had New Line Cinema and just let Bruce Campbell do what he wanted. Kicking off in third place is going to be Friday the 13th Part 2. The second film that came after the success of the first film. This is a far better entry than the first film the year before this. And this was a movie where Jason entered the picture. And for the first time, for the first while, he had his bag head mask. And it takes place five years after the first film, after the sole survivor of the first film's death. And it gives Camp Crystal Lake some time to recover. And of course, a group of counselors intend to reopen the resort. But instead of going back to the scene of the crime, they take up shop a few hundred yards down the river. And in fact, they're so close that people are able to wander into the old stomping ground. And Jason is now out for revenge after his mom's death. He's there to hack him up one by one. Yeah, have Ginny, Ginny Field, our hero of the film, actually lays down some good analysis on Jason. What he would be like if he was still alive. How would, he, how would he think like a child even though he had been an adult? And it's had some juiciness to his story. And sure, there's plenty of scares and some good kills, but it's nice to have some steak with that sizzle. And the finale is definitely one of my favorites of the, of the finales of this franchise. And they come to find out that Jason's kept a keepsake from his mom, almost like a shrine to her. And all the two end up dying in the end, but it creates some problems heading to the next film. And as expected, there's one final jump scare at the end. The original heroine was definitely, though, if there's a problem, though, the original movie's heroine was honestly horrible. So, I don't know why people were so mad she got killed because I didn't even like her character. She was useless. Amy Steele was a much better lead character this time around and she takes over the sequel and she's miles ahead of any miles ahead of most slasher film actresses. She's gorgeous. She's likable. And you feel for her character much more than you did with the character in the first film. 
The beginning is definitely a great umbilical cord to the original. It kicks off with a suspenseful stalking, and the murders are more graphic. It's better in this case because that's why people see the series is for mostly for the graphic murders. The final chase sequence is a whole lot better than the first Friday the Thirteenth. And the only nitpicks, though, it definitely be that its unusual structure is uneven. That's a twenty-minute long predate sequence, and it follows by a joke sequence involving a chew truck, then a lengthy full. Lull in action when we're introduced to the characters before kicking back into gear for the second half, but then a letdown of a pointless, nonsensical ending, and marrying an otherwise great horror flick. The film should have just ended as Jeannie and Paul just walked out of the shack Jason lived in, but the good outweighs the bad in this film, and I still think it manages to top the first one. It's one of those horror sequels that's better than the first film. The writers really try to get a bit psychological here, with the heroine hypnotizing about what made Jason's mother kill, and what Jason would be like if he had lived. It's definitely an interesting twist right there. And a seemingly higher budget also helps as does better photography and more attempts at suspense in believing the bloodletting. The characters are definitely not as obnoxious as in a lot of other slashers, which also works in the film's favor. And also, the ending of this movie leaves you wanting more, which is totally what you get for the next stuff that comes after this movie. Of course, in second place is going to very much be Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Well, okay. Not really a final chapter. Because they still made more after this. Friday Part 4 is easily one of the greatest slasher films to be ever made with that being said. And it looks like that axe in the head didn't really keep old Jason down though. Because he awakens from Part 3 because he awakens to the hospital, adds more corpses to the morgue, and returns home to Crystal Lake. If, and he finds even more kids showing up at camp for some late night fun. So Jason's up to his old tricks again. But this time he now faces a boy named Tarman Jarvis, played by Corey Feldman, an 80s legend, who is a make makeup wizard. And can Tommy stop Jason? Now with this being said, this is a great installment and it really shows the best stuff of this series. The intriguing tone, and because Jason still has the mask on, we just don't see it until 20 minutes at the end. And it's a way to go back to its old roots. The violence on here has darkened up with brutal disturbing death scenes. And it has probably the number one best death in the whole series, as Jason's death himself as a human. The acting is great and amusing at some times, especially thanks to Crispin Glover in this movie. The all too bright lighting of part 3 is replaced by the most somber realistic of the entire series, and so those use of Jason quite simply outclasses any other director since, with the viewer hardly allowed to see him properly until the finale. And Tom Savini returns to provide some excellent makeup, refining the best unmasked Jason of them all, and even Barney Cohen's script is pretty good, allowing an interesting array of characters to develop, and Director Zito does a pretty good job. He keeps things moving a lot and manages to inject some tension and atmosphere to the film. And the infamous hockey mask does barely feature in this one, though, as Jason is still kept as a killing machine and nothing more. He has no real character or likability in this one, but the gore is still strong, and this one, unlike the other entries in the series, which were cut to shreds, Jason hacksaws some, someone's throat, people are stabbed, have meat cutters stuck in their heads, they're impaled in various objects, someone has a knife plunged to the back of their head while someone else has a knife stuck through their throat, and Jason's death in this one is great because, it's the, because of all the effects by Tom Savini. And the movie introduces us to the best protagonist of the series, Tommy, who's played wonderfully in this one by Corey Feldman. And Ted White, who plays Jason, is a scary as hell Jason, and easily, he'd probably be around third place for me for the best Jasons. If I did have a nitpick, though, is that the ending feels way too anticlimactic. It's all Tommy really does. It's all how the movie really ends. It's just Tommy just hacks Jason while yelling, Die! 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 Repeatedly. And there's no real confrontation. And he just ends up in a psychic war. So, and it's not really a final chapter because they still continue to make more movies after this. So, maybe, although with that anticlimactic ending, maybe there's a reason they made more. With that being said, though, let's finally end this ranking with what I think is the number one best film in this whole series. And with that being said, the number one best Friday the 13th movie will always be Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. This movie is without a doubt my obvious number one favorite of the franchise. It's the most fun, it's the most self-aware of the series. Jason Lives is easily my number one favorite of the series. It's also one of my personal favorite horror movies of all time. This movie is the bomb. It's definitely one of the it's definitely one of the best horror slashers of the 80s, along with Nightmare on Elm Street and Elm Street Free Dream Warriors. They they don't really make they they didn't make slashers much like this after this movie. 
And I wish that Hollywood would, and I wish they would have tried to make more flasher films like this one back then after this. The movie had everything, and I just loved to death from the setting, the music from the actors, just everything it has in here. Tommy Jarvis goes to the graveyard in this movie to get rid of Jason Voorhees' his body once and for all, but bring, but ends up accidentally bringing him back to life instead. And now the newly revived killer once again seeks revenge, and Tommy may be the only one who can defeat him. Director Tom McLovin has literally recreated Jason after the turn events on part 5. He replaced the character's once human figure from parts 2 to 4 with a better, more menacing, grosser, unkillable zombie-like figure. And in this installment, it seems as if Jason stopped chasing his victims and became a little more quiet and self-told about his kills. Most of all, McLovin really, McLaughlin really makes Jason live in this movie. Jason thrives. McLaughlin also directed was definitely the around the fourth best Jason, easily. As well, and I always still jump when he when this Jason appears in front of, in front of Sissy, and the acting is extremely acceptable for its predecessors, especially the roles of Tommy Jarvis, who's played by Tom Matthews in this one, and Sheriff Garris played by David Kaga in this one. Even the camp counselors live on up their roles a bit. And I definitely thought it was inevitable for them to be slaughtered, and I still thought it was cool that I still remember their characters. There's just something about this one. Jason Lewis had an excellent storyline that delivers. But the gore is relatively low at certain times. McLovin never fails to bring it all back with shots of that very, very bloody machete of Jason's. And the sequel contains many of the favorite death scenes so far in this series. And what McLovin did in this movie that previous directors didn't was he actually made Jason unpredictable. I mean, you know he's going to kill the counselors, but you don't know when or where. And I love the feeling of uncertainty. McLovin has Jason looking out of the windows, behind doors. A scary part is when Jason is unknowingly in the mortar home as the teenagers pull away from the camp. There's also... A lot of the usual ch 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 and deep black darkness enhanced Jason's menacing figure. And honestly, Jason also has one of the best defeats in his film when he gets chained to the bottom of the lake by Tommy Jarvis. And the score by Henry Manfredi is sensational, creepy, intense, and is one of the best scores in this series, matching the tone of the movie perfectly. And Tommy is the best in this one because he's not some weakling geek like in the past two films here, this one, he's much more of a badass in this one. This movie just has a great storyline, good death scenes, and cool special effects for Jason's return from the dead. And though, if there was a problem though, it's probably just logical errors in the movie, but that's it. Friday the 13th Part 6 Jason Lives is no doubt the best Friday the 13th movie yet, and always will be one of the best films in slasher cinema history. Ah, oh, and there we go, guys. We have officially ranked all the Friday the 13th movies. I'll clean up this box set a little bit, put it back in its original spot. But we did it. We got them all done. It was interesting. Now, I want to know in the comments down below how you guys would rank all these movies from worst to best in your opinions. And once again, guys, happy Friday the 13th, everybody. And until then, that'll be it for this franchise ranking and episode. Thank you all for watching. If you liked this one, see more. And don't forget to like, subscribe to Donji Corleone.